to share a stage with both of you is really a great honor. It would be improper if I didn't begin with uh, the headlines of the day, um, which is the, uh, the apparent collapse of the government of Israel, but ask you this question. Your government collapses. You are the ambassador of Israel to Washington. You had just welcomed and hosted this or that minister in Washington. You had just vouched for them at the White House, brought them into the Oval Office, said that they represent the word of the Prime Minister. The next day you turn on your television set, you see the Prime Minister call them the worst possible names. <laughs> Say that they are horrible people, liars, cheaters, thieves. What do you do? How do you... <laughs> What, how do you explain, you know, this isn't such a crazy scenario. Right, right. It's a daily scenario. How do you explain your government to the President of the United States, to the Secretary of State, and to the U.S. administration? It's a mark. <clears throat> right. You say, Mr. President, you have the White House Correspondents' Dinner once a year. We have it year round. <laughs> <laughs> and I say Manishtana. Manishtana. I would have a situation where if one minister come into town and say, Israel will never redivide Jerusalem. Next day, another minister would come into town and say, Israel will divide Jerusalem and give half of it to the Palestinians. Get the same phone call. So what's your government's position? And I have to go to explain that we have a, a collegial form of government, that the prime minister is not the commander in chief, and it's, you know, you have to work by consensus, and that the government's position is the government's position, which is, sounds vaguely tautological, <laughs> because it's vaguely tautological. Um, um, your answer is that this, this, is, this, is, this is par for the course. Every day is like that. Yeah. <laughs> on, a, on a little more serious note, a great friend of uh, the Washington Institute, the late uh, Sam Lewis, uh, when he arrived uh, at his post as U.S. Ambassador in Israel in 1977, the only member of the uh, U.S. Embassy uh, staff who knew Menachem Begin was the public affairs officer. No one in the political section of the U.S. Embassy in the mid-1970s bothered uh, to get to know Menachem Begin. And so it was Mr. Moss, who, uh, the public affairs officer, who arranged for the first meeting between uh, the new American ambassador and, and the Israeli prime minister. So uh, the United States has learned a lesson since then. You, you are getting to know every minor and median figure uh, in Israeli politics, I think there, there's a much higher level of understanding, and uh, there's still more to learn, as, uh, uh, as we found out. The change may not be as, uh, as uh, dramatic uh, at, the, at the end of the day, though the task of the ambassador may not be as tough as it seems. Let, let me ask you, if I can, gentlemen, a, a broader question. Um, there's, of course, this old Jewish joke, how are you, and, two, and one word, good, and two words, not good. Right? <laughs> we just, not if, you, if you Don't followed me. the opinion pages of, uh, of Israel just this past week. Great line. If you followed the opinion pages of Israel just this past week, you saw a version of this playing out with leaders of the Israeli national security establishment. One former head of Mossad, Shabtai Shavit wrote an op-ed saying, these are the darkest days for Zionism. Then a few days later, the former head of military intelligence, Amos Yadlin, wrote an op-ed saying, these are the best days for Israel and for Zionism. Mm. Which is it? And can both be true? Yes. Michael, you want to start? Yeah, definitely. In, 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 uh, in 1953, Moshe Dayan, uh, made his first trip to the Pentagon as Israel's chief of staff. And they asked him, what's your geostrategic situation? How's the IDF going to fare? He says, Israel 
is on the verge of annihilation. Any minute the Arab armies can descend on us and wipe us off the map. Then he paused, took a breath, and said, in two weeks, the IDF can be in downtown Damascus. <laughs> so this is not new, OK? Good, not good. And if I had you know, a half an hour, I'd say that I, uh, the national security advisor of the president once asked me to, to categorize Israel's uh, geostrategic political situation the same way. And I said, well, I said, in the best of cases, we are in May 1967. In the worst of cases, we are in May 1948. He looked at me in shock, and he said, how can that be? I said, well, like in 67, certainly in 48, we're surrounded by uh, turmoil. Um, Israeli leaders uh, get up in the morning, and they face the broadest po possible spectrum of monumental threats, everything from a nuclearizing Iran to Egypt unraveling, Syrian civil war, 100,000 rockets in, in, uh, in Lebanon, Jordan tottering, Palestinians won't negotiate. It's, 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 uh, it's quite a challenge, and I haven't talked about Gaza. Um, on the other hand, you could step on the brakes and say, Israel's in the best possible geostrategic situation it's ever been in its entire 66 and a half years of existence. We have peace with Egypt and Jordan. It was unthinkable when I was a student. We have uh, relations with the former Soviet bloc countries that once wanted to knock us off, too. Um, 22 years of relations with China, 22, relations of, of, uh, 20 years of relations with India. Uh, a thriving high-tech economy sector, um, and we have with the United States of America something we didn't have in 67 and 48, which we have the most, we have the deepest and most multifaceted alliance which the United States has probably had with any country in its post-World War II period, all in the same breath. Moshe Dayan had it right in 1953. <clears throat> so, are you an optimist about this, Ibtar? Well, I, I know what Lynn just said. What Lynn said. I'll put it this way, uh, it, it is a very, a very complex situation. On the one hand, let me cite two very positive developments. Israel is not threatened by any conventional Arab army at this time. Second, Israel now has gas offshore. The first three customers of Israeli gas are going to be the Palestinian Authority, Jordan, and Egypt. Unbelievable. Incredible. At the same time, we face a potentially nuclear Iran more than 100,000 rockets and missiles facing us, Hamas in Gaza, Hezbollah in Lebanon, so forth and so forth. What, what, what does it all amount to? It amounts to uh, the, the need for statesmanship, uh, the second or the first part of, of this award. What it takes is Israeli statesmanship to, to take this complex situation, to make the most of it, and to minimize the risk. So I cannot think of a, of a more important time for, for leadership to, to arise. We are now going to face a very ugly period of about 90, 100 days. I can only wish all of us that the net result would be a statesman at the, uh, or a statesperson at the, head of, uh, at the head of the government and a more workable coalition and government. Amen. Amen. I want to go back in time for a minute and ask you, Itamar, um, about your experience with Syria. Syria is now, for the first time in a generation, it's on the front pages of American newspapers. And almost all Americans now know that there is this place that is collapsing, that there's this horrible conflict, that there's terrorist groups, this uh, horrible group that is severing heads. But it wasn't too many years ago that you came very close in negotiating peace with the father of the current ruler. Do you ever look at that experience and say, Whew, thank God we didn't actually reach it, because otherwise ISIS would be not on the other side of the Golan, but right on the overlooking Tiberius? Or if you had reached it, would the Middle East look very different today? Yeah, I, I think the latter. I think you have to, to bear in mind that we were negotiating with Syria, but Syria was negotiating primarily with Washington and then with us. And had peace been made, it would have been peace with Washington and peace with Israel, which would have entailed a total transformation of life in Syria. Syria would have to open up. And Lebanon would, uh, would, would have joined Syria. It would have been a, a different Middle East. And I think that one of the reasons that the deal was not made was that Assad's generals would come to him and say, 
this would be tantamount to a suicide. If we make peace with Israel and there is no enemy, then who needs us? <laughs> uh, who can justify this huge army and security apparatus and so forth and so forth? In other words, had Syria made peace with Israel, there would be no Syrian revolt in 2011 and, and therefore the question would not, would not have arisen. So I, I can look back and not, not feel uh, any great relief that, uh, that peace was not, was not made. Now, let's look forward in I was, this. I was, I was say, fortunately, I, we never came close to making peace with anybody, so you can ask. In your turn. No, I'm not going to even ask that. that question. But let me, let me move forward uh -huh. with this <laughs> issue. Because so far, Israel has essentially succeeded in staying out of the Syrian conflict. And it isn't first on the list of targets, at least yet, for ISIS and for all the nastiness that is on your border. When you gentlemen look in the future, do you see Israel succeeding in staying out of this conflict? Do you see Israel playing a role in this conflict? What do you think Israel ought to do vis-a-vis -vis its north? Yeah. Michael, you want to start? Because I, I see the problem, is not, the problem is not Syria. The problem is the post-World War I um, framework for the Middle East, the, the, the Sykes-Picot framework, which is unraveling. But Europeans came around at the end of World War I and said, okay, tomorrow you're a Syrian, tomorrow you're an Iraqi, uh, tomorrow you're a Palestinian, here are your borders, um, live with them. Uh, we'll empower some family, some clan, give them a big army, hold it together um, in case we go home. And they eventually went home. They went home, the power in the center unraveled, and then the entire order began to come apart. So the problem of Syria is the problem of Iraq. And frankly, the problem of Syria and Iraq is the problem of the Palestinians. Um, the question is, which of these societies can sustain a state structure? And in the absence of the ability of these societies to sustain a state structure, what is Israel going to do? And I don't think there's a cookie-cutter uh, policy that fits all. If the Syrian civil war starts to seep across our northern border, we'll respond to it. Um, if ISIS starts to, um, to undermine the stability of Jordan, we'll respond to it. With the Palestinians, I don't think we have to wait around to, for another round for the Palestinians to prove to us that they are incapable of supporting uh, a state structure um, because they hold the record of, of people that have been offered a state most frequently in history and have turned it down almost, almost entirely with violence. So I think we should get the message and say that if we want to preserve ourselves as a Jewish and democratic state, if we want to guard our population as best we can, then we have to make decisions by ourselves. Uh, Itamar talked earlier about statesmanship and leadership. I think the leadership has to be that we don't outsource our fundamental security and destiny to uh, Palestinian decision makers whose only decision they can make is, is trying to isolate us and sanction us in the UN. Um, and so the, the response to Syria is the response to everything that is happening in the Middle East. It's Israel taking responsibility for itself. Israel taking responsibility. <clears throat> Itamar? Yeah. <clears throat> You know, I've been, a, in many respects, a critic of, of this uh, outgoing government, but uh, it does get good grades for managing the, the Syrian conflict, the Egyptian relationship, very well. Uh, so as, as long as it's up to us, I think uh, we can maintain uh, or keep ourselves out of the conflict, but it's not entirely up to us. Um, one thing, if Iran decides that Hezbollah should uh, start playing games with us, not through the Lebanese border, but through the, uh, the Golan Heights, then uh, we may not be able to, to stay out. Um, same with ISIS. Uh, Mr. Baghdadi is very smart. He, he knows how to pick his enemies, and he's not picked us. But he may change his mind. So uh, the bottom line is, uh, as far as we are concerned, I think uh, it, it would make sense for us, and it's quite likely that we stay out. If the choice is in the hands of Hezbollah, Iran, or ISIS, then uh, we may find ourselves deeply in the crisis. When you walked into the hotel tonight, I don't know how many of you noticed this, but you walked under a flag of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia about <laughs> as big as Central Park. Really? So, given that we're honoring two Israeli ambassadors in a hotel with the Saudi flag out front, let me ask you this. There's a lot of talk these days about Israel having relationships with Sunni states, whether it's Saudi Arabia or the Emirates, certainly Jordan and Egypt. 
Is there the possibility or is it a flight of fantasy that Israel and the Sunnis could really work together against ISIS on one hand and against Iran on the other? Itamar? Uh, the answer is yes. If we begin with this very hotel, let's remember it was bought just a few years ago in a partnership by an Israeli tycoon and a Saudi prince. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they worked together on this, uh, on this hotel, but in a, in a, larger, in a larger way. Yes, uh, the Sunni countries are very keen on collaborating with Israel, uh, but the entry ticket to, uh, uh, to this is movement on the Palestinian front. I'm saying movement. I'm not saying solution because I don't think that solution or resolution is around the corner. It's not entirely in our hands and it's not feasible for now. But between resolution and between staying with the status quo or exacerbating the status quo, there's a whole spectrum. And if we move, begin to move on that spectrum, I think Saudis and Qataris and others would be very happy to work with us. Was that your experience as ambassador? No, in ambassador, in Washington, you know, um, most, Israel, most Arab ambassadors will talk to you. They divide into three categories. Those who will have lunch with you publicly, those who will have lunch with you privately, and those who won't have lunch with you. Um, and the latter category was the smallest category by far, and the Saudis fell within it. I could be in, in, in an elevator with a Saudi ambassador who'd look right through me like I was glass. So you have to distinguish between what's going on, say, on, on say, the ambassadorial level and what may be going on on other levels. I think there's a greater confluence of interest at this point between Israel and Sunni countries, particularly in the Gulf, than at any time in our national existence. Whether this can translate into open cooperation, having lunch publicly, uh, remains to be seen. But um, discreetly, uh, implicitly, I think there, there's a tremendous amount of uh, cooperation and understanding that we face very, very similar threats uh, in the form of ISIL, in the form of Iran, in the form of the Muslim Brotherhood also. Um, and that I agree with it, Tamar, that the, the sine qua non for any type of open cooperation would be movement on the Palestinian issue which I don't, you know, I, I'm very skeptical about it, about whether that's in the cards right now, but I think we can pursue it and, um, and work within the framework of what is eventually becoming not a two-state solution, because like, frankly, I have sort of, I have um, erased the word solution from my vocabulary, but we basically have uh, evolving a two-state situation in the West Bank. Well, let, let, me, let me ask very briefly on this issue, because we've, uh, we, we're, we're now been talking about this issue since the before the founding of the Washington Institute, will there be a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Will there be, in our collective lifetimes, peace between Israelis and Palestinians? Itamar. I don't, I don't know, you know, from the height of my age, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But uh, I believe so. And, you know, let's look at Europe. Let's look at Europe. The idea of the European community was conceived by Jean Monnet, the Frenchman, in the middle of World War II, when France was occupied by Germany. And people must, must have thought that uh, this man was out of his mind to speak about a united Europe led by France and Germany in the middle of World War II. And lo and behold, 20, 30 years later, that vision became a reality. So, I think the Israeli-Palestinian problem, the Arab-Israeli problem, can be resolved over time. Not right now, but over time. Hopefully, in my lifetime. <laughs> Amen. Um, uh, you, uh, Michael, have written about a wonkish idea called coordinated unilateralisms, a two-state situation. Mm -hmm. Is the conflict going to get solved in your lifetime? No, I don't, again, I don't use the word uh, solution. I don't think there's solutions for any Middle Eastern conflicts. Um, I'm not sure there's a solution for life, at least not one we want to talk about. Um, and what we can look at, ways we can better manage the situation, uh, better ensure our security, our identity as a Jewish and democratic state, and ways that we, we can, I think, enhance the life of uh, the daily lives of Israeli and Palestinians on the ground. I think it's happening even now. In, in effect, you have almost close to a two-state situation because there are very few Israeli, very little, limited Israeli military presence in areas like Ramallah and, and Nablus and Janine. And on the ground, you have a tremendous amount of cooperation, whether it be, you mentioned it, Itamar, in energy and water, uh, in trade, 
uh, export, Palestinian exports through Israeli ports, um, we can build on that. And um, if someday, and I think it's very important we maintain the vision of a two-state solution as a vision and keep the door open to it, if some Palestinian leader is either willing or able to go through that door, I think he's going to find an Israeli people that's still willing to, to make the necessary sacrifices. But in the interim, we can better manage the situation and we can better work to ameliorate daily lives for Palestinians and Israelis alike. Okay. All right. Two former ambassadors from Israel to America. Who was the most impressive American policymaker with whom you ever worked? Itamar? Uh, in, in the best uh, bipartisan spirit, uh, Bill Clinton and Jim Baker. Uh, okay. Michael? Now I gotta think, I just, I'm gonna think, whatever I say, this is, this is like an impossible question for an ambassador this close out of office, okay? He's got the 20 years behind him. Very easy to do that, retrospect. Um, there were um, two great uh, legislators that I, that I work with. Avoid the administration altogether, I see. No, no, I mean, I was, <laughs> you said policymaker. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, ooh. Uh, Lindsey Graham in the Senate. Um, a truly great legislator, a truly great legislator. And in the House, I, I want to say, um, Elliot Engel here from New York, um, and um, it was wonderful. And uh, Neil Lowey, by the way, I'm saying it in the same breath. Uh, Nita was Nita special, and uh, the great legislators. All right, let me look. You, Itamar, you were here. You were in Washington at a time of unusual closeness between our two presidents, uh, president and prime minister. Uh, Michael, you were in Washington at a time of. Well, shall we say less than unusual closeness between president and prime minister. Mm -hmm. When you look at the situation that confronts America and Israel today, mm -hmm. and I know there's a, lot of, there's a lot of naysaying and shrying about where this relationship is going, how much of it is, in your view, a clash of personalities? How much of it is something more fundamental demographic shifts, fundamental shifts of strategy and policy. Which do you put more weight on? Michael? Okay. Well, I mean, look in an aggregate way, you'll see that uh, support for Israel among the American public today is close to an all-time high. Roughly three-quarters of the American population will define themselves to one degree or another as being pro-Israel. That puts us in a category with Sweden and Canada. It's very, very rare. Uh, so it's nothing about what's going on in, in the American public. I think that um, this administration has a worldview. It is a very, it's an, a very centralized administration. It's an ideological administration. And it has a worldview that does not always accord with the worldview of any Israeli government, not just this Israeli government. I don't, I don't, I don't think you're going to find any Israeli government that, that's going to define Gilo and French Hill as settlements, for example. Or an Israeli government that would be capable, even under Israeli law, of freezing building in those large Jewish neighbors of Jerusalem. It just couldn't happen. So you have an ideological difference. Um, you have an ideological that spreads not just to Israel, but to, to, to the Arab world. I think we always talk about it, Rob, going back to the foundational document of the Obama administration in the Middle East, which was the Cairo speech of, uh, of June 2009. To understand so much what has happened in, in the last five years, always go back to that document. Uh, something that uh, Professor Lewis taught me. Always go back to the sources. There's a source. Um, and that is going to be a difference. Israel, um, true, is heading in a different way politically. And the next elections, I'm not, a, I'm not a prophet. I'm a historian, and I have enough problems predicting the past. Um, <laughs> but if you look at the polls that came out today, Israel's likely to have a more right-wing, uh, more right-of-center uh, coalition as a result of the next coalition. America may be working, working in a different way, and uh, is yet to be seen. So um, you have to, the, the picture is not so black and white. On one hand, you have governments that have moved far apart, and it's not just personal, is my point. On the other hand, you have an American population, which even after the events of last summer and the very difficult pictures that the press made sure to come out of Gaza last summer, even during last summer, support for Israel in this country went up again. It's more? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned uh, my admiration for, for Rabin and the love affair between Clinton and himself that 
Rested, among other things. You don't mean Clinton and himself. You mean Clinton and Rabin. And Rabin. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> was, uh, was, predicated, was predicated also on Rabin's directness, openness, and the trust between, between the two of them, which is obviously lacking now. I'd rather not look at the past six years, but at the next two years. And my advice to whoever becomes Israel's next prime minister would be go to America, meet the president, and say you have two years left to define a legacy. That legacy in this or that way is going to be determined also in the Middle East. And I want to work with you on that, on that legacy. Here is what I can do. Here is what I cannot do. I am completely open with you. And let's identify the overlap of our interests in what I can do. And let's make the, two, the next two years much better than the past six years. I want to take that theme and just ask you about Iran, ask both of you about Iran. Now, I think it was when, about the time that you were ambassador, that the first Israeli government officials came to Washington and warned the administration, the Clinton administration, about the Iranian nuclear program. It's 20 years, and Israelis are still warning about the Iranian nuclear program. And Israelis are still threatening to take action, and Israelis aren't. And the Iranians still don't have a bomb. Mm -hmm. How do you see, are we near crunch time when, after this 20-year period, clearly the administration would like to reach an agreement with Iran? When push comes to shove, how do you think this or whatever government of Israel will react when an agreement is reached, one that is not a made in Israel agreement? How do you think this or any government would react? Michael? I don't know how this government would react. I'll just, I can only give you my personal view. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a private citizen now. Um, Israel's margin for error on Iran is exactly zero. Um, if you believe that uh, President Rouhani is a moderate and not just a facade, that there's actually a fundamental change in Iranian policy with regard to terror, with regard to undermining regimes in the Middle East and beyond, if you believe that what we see of the Iranian program is what there is, in the face of evidence over the last 34 years when what we saw was not what there was, if you believe that the Iranians are not lying anymore um, after they've systematically lied for 30, 40 years about their Iranian nuclear, about the nuclear program, if you believe that the international community will be capable of identifying when Iran breaks or sneaks out and will react within 10 months militarily to stop it, then support. Uh, you know, in full force, a, a, an agreement on Iran. If your children's life depends on it, and my kids' and my grandkids' life depend on it, you may reach a different conclusion. Israel is a Jewish state with a particularly tragic history, and we have not come back after 2,000 years of exile to disappear in this way. Israel has the right, Israel has the duty, and Israel has the capability of defending itself. And as an historian, not, as a, not just as a citizen and former ambassador, in 1948, in 1967, in 1956, under different prime ministers, uh, folks came to us and said, give us more time for diplomacy. Let us work it out. And in each case, Ben-Gurion, Levi Eshkol reached a conclusion that Israel's existence was at stake. And Israel had to exercise its sovereign rights. I'm not saying when, how, if, but, but that is the situation, and that I dearly hope will not change for our perspective. It, it tomorrow. Yeah. So if you ask me, you know, what is your one line uh, summary of four years of negotiations with Syria? I would say the story about buying the carpets in the bazaar is true. Say, haggling in the Middle East is, uh, is a major 
component of, uh, of life. And rule number one in buying the, the carpet in the bazaar is don't seem to be too eager. And my problem in, with the negotiation is now being held is that the United States, the West seem too eager, the Iranians know that they can tinker with, uh, with the price. So in that imaginary conversation between Israel's new prime minister and, and the president, this needs to be reiterated. I think the danger is not so much to Israel's existence as such. The Iranians know very well that Israel is a second and a third strike capability. Uh, the danger is to the world. If, if Iran goes nuclear, so will Saudi Arabia. The Saudi bomb is somewhere in Pakistan on a shelf. Turkey, Egypt, there'll be a nuclear Middle East. The whole non-proliferation treaty regime will collapse. The world is going to be a mess. It's not just our problem. And uh, this needs to be reiterated time and again. Also, the implied threat that Michael mentioned before uh, could be used by the president. He, he say to the Iranians at some point, you know, here I am, but who, who knows about, about the Israelis? So coordination between Israel and the United States on this can be restored. The game can be divided between the bad cop and, and the mad cop. <laughs> and uh, um, we, mm -hmm. we can jointly deal with that, uh, with that issue much more effectively. The bad cop and the mad cop. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, let, let me close by asking one last question. And it's something that you hinted at earlier, Itamar, when you offered um, a, uh, uh, a small piece of advice about how to deal with the next two years. But I'd like to ask both of you to expand on this, because these are two critical years, given how much chaos there is in the Middle East, given that against his, his, his preference, Middle East issues and fighting in the Middle East is now near the top of the president's agenda. If you were advising, if not the prime minister, certainly Israel's ambassador in Washington, but let's say you're advising the, the prime minister who emerges from the next election, what advice do you give him on how best to work with Washington over the balance of this administration so that when 2017 comes around, a new president comes into office, Israel and the United States are already on a better glide path for their relationship. Itamar. Go ahead. Well, in, in, in addition, on top of everything that we've said before, you, you just say to your, uh, to your interlocutor in Washington, look at, the, look at the Middle East, look at the one place that is an island of stability, that is reliable, that is a world-class military power, that is a world-class uh, locus of, uh, of technology, and is a loyal, loyal friend of, of the United States. And when you count your chips, you know what, uh, what chip, chip we are, and here we are to work with you. That, I think, would be a good starting point. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, we really have no choice but to be allies with one another. It's not as Israel has a, a wide choice of allies to select, and we just happen to be fortunate enough to live in a miraculous day with the greatest military power on Earth also happens to be the greatest democracy, and, uh, and happens to be our closest ally. Um, and the United States, I think, is, as Itamar mentioned, doesn't have a great choice of, of, of militarily, scientifically, technologically, uh, robust, democratic, uh, states that, which never hosts an anti-American demonstration and American flags aren't burned out in the streets and the presidents can kill, come, there, come there and give a speech in front of students and be applauded in the Middle East. There's only one place like that, that's the state of Israel. If I were to give advice to whoever is going to be elected in, these, uh, in, in our coming contest, my advice would be the same advice that I gave to the Prime Minister during my entire tenure, which was we have to think um, of Israel's uh, relationship with the United States in terms of a bank account. All right, you have to make deposits in the bank account. In, in the year 2002, the IDF launched an operation against the Second Intifada, Operation Defensive Shield. We were able to, to write a check to do that uh, operation because we had made a down 
payment, a deposit into our diplomatic account at Camp David in 2000. In 2006, we were able to fight against Lebanon, uh, against, the, against Hezbollah in Lebanon, because of the disengagement from Gaza, which was a deposit in our diplomatic bank account. In 2008, we were able to fight against Hamas in the Gaza Strip because of the deposit made uh, by, by, by the offer of a state to Mahmoud Abbas that he turned down. Uh, last summer, we went into a, a, a military conflict uh, pretty much with an empty bank account, kind of with an overdraft. And I have to think, we have to think about the, the neighborhood in which we live, in which we may have to once again resort to defending ourselves by military means. We're going to require space. We're going to require time. We have fateful challenges in the form of the Iranian nuclear program. We haven't really talked about what the Palestinians intend to do with the UN, but what they tend to do is declare a state there and use that state as a basis for, for taking us down economically through sanctions. It's a, it's a strategic threat, it's not a tactical threat. Um, we have to make deposits in our diplomatic bank account. That will give us leeway, and it will give us what to draw a check on when we have to draw that check. May it never happen. Friends, please join me in thanking our 2014 Scholar Statesman honorees Itamar Rabinovich and Michael Oren.